Another example, and this one makes perfect sense instantly, you look at the world of female primates and lots of different species, and there's ranking systems, there's a hierarchy, and what's the hierarchy built around? You get a rank one below that of your mother. You inherit your rank. Your mom is the alpha female, you're her first daughter, so you're number two. And as soon as she has another daughter, your kid sister is number three. Until you have a first daughter who pushes your kid sister down one step. In other words, dominance hierarchies amongst the females are entirely nepotistic. Whoa, how can you explain that? Part, part number two, kin selection, dominant systems in all sorts of social species are built around the nepotism of relatedness. So that makes sense. Next one, next interesting notion here, which is one of those choices, one of those choices that are not conscious choices, but you're about to get pregnant and you have a choice as whatever species you are. Do you want to have a male or a female? Or do you want to have a litter of males or females? Or do you want to have a litter that's predominant male or predominantly female? And it comes down to an issue now of two things, which is how much does it cost to have a female versus a male during pregnancy? And what are the reproductive probabilities of having a male versus a female? Back to this issue, you are in a big tournament species, and as we saw, there's high degrees of male variability in reproductive success. 5% of the guys are accounting for 95% of the, of the matings. So you sit, you sit there, and what you've got is a rule that if you go for a son, like 90% of sons running around there are never going to reproduce, and you hit the jackpot and you have the 5% at the very top, and each of them are gonna like father 30 different kids, going for males in a tournament species is a big gamble. It's a risky move. Going for a female, however, there's no female primate out there who has 420 kids because she lays eggs like a salmon. Most females there, unless they have some fertility problem, they all have something roughly one to five kids or so over the course of the life of an old world primate. So female variability is way down. In other words, what's a conservative strategy to pass on copies of your genes? Have a daughter. What's a riskier strategy? Have a son. And what that immediately predicts is two things. Number one, you look in dominance hierarchies, and the prediction is that females who are high ranking should show more of a tendency towards having sons than daughters. And females who are low ranking, exactly the opposite. And that's what you see in a bunch of primate species that have this sort of structure. Next prediction. You should then predict that when ecological circumstances get tough, when times are tough, you want to go for the offspring that costs less. A female fetus is less calorically demanding than a male fetus. Male fetuses cost more to bring to term than females do. The prediction should be during times of ecological pressure, the percentage of females being born should increase. And as a measure of the fact that males are more expensive as fetuses, something like 53% of fertilizations in humans are males. About a 53 to 47% ratio. And over the course of pregnancy, the cost, the increased metabolic vulnerability of male fetuses are such that by the time birth comes around, it's around 5149. And it's not until adolescence that it flips over to the typical pattern of female dominance. You've got to have more male fetuses to start off with because they are more expensive, more vulnerable. So, this prediction during times of ecological duress, you should get a bias towards more females males being born, the 50-50 ratio skewing in that direction. And that's precisely what you wind up seeing. And you see all sorts of examples of this in humans, for example, during periods of famine, food deprivation, the ratio of birth skewed towards females. What you also see as a measure of that is among humans, a boy giving birth to a boy statistically decreases the body weight, is likely to decrease the body weight of the next offspring. It's expensive having one of those males. And what you wind up getting then is fluctuation as a function of your dominance rank. If you're high ranking, it's almost always worth the gamble to go for one of those high risk, high payoff boys. If you're low ranking, go for the far more conservative female. You've got this fluctuation around this 50-50 ratio. And this was something worked out by one of these sort of 
founding figures of sort of modern evolutionary thinking, a guy named Robert Trivers in the 1970s, sex ratio fluctuation as a function of social context. And people have gone and looked, and it's precisely this. You get an interesting bit of conservatism in this, though, which is there's some circumstance where it makes perfect sense for you to have a gazillion daughters because that's the time to do it. And at some point, you're having a gazillion daughters and everybody else is having a gazillion daughters. And suddenly, males become really valuable because there's not a whole lot of them around. So the logical thing to do then is to switch over and start having males. And everything else being equal, after a while, with a, with a predominance of males, it's going to make sense to switch over the females, you have density dependent selection. You will always have oscillating around 50%. Whichever sex is in the smaller number, that one is immediately more preferable. Poor ecological conditions pushes you this way. Dominus rank push you one way or the other. But in any of those circumstances, you have an oscillation around the mean. Whichever is more common is less desirable. So sex ratio fluctuation. <clears throat> 